Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Today we're going to drive a car I have not yet driven. I've uh, read about these. I'm a huge Lancia enthusiast. If you've been to this website before, you've seen my Aurelia. Here, take a look. Certainly one of the most advanced cars of the era, as this one is too. This is a 1967 Lancia Fulvia Sport. Fulvia is an odd name. It sounds like you're talking about some woman's parts or something, but I, I, I would have chosen something different. But that's the name of the car. Front wheel drive, four cylinder, whereas the Aurelia is a V6. I've always been leery of front wheel drive cars from this era because they didn't seem like real sports cars to me. So I'm anxious to drive this one. Let's meet the owner. He is a uh, journalist. He writes for one of my favorite magazines as well as other sports car market. Uh, he is an automobile appraiser as well. And uh, you may have seen him on our Pe Pebble Beach special we did a while back. Donald Osborne. Donald, come on in. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Hey, Jay. How are you? This Good is a beautiful well. car. How long you had it? Um, I bought this car in 1999, and uh, I immediately fell in love with this car. Uh, I bought it from a friend of mine mm -hmm. who had had it stuck in the back of his barn. He meant to do something with it for years. He bought it from the original owner, and I bought it from him, and I had the car refurbished for the road. Right. Not restored, but refurbished for the road. And uh, then I traded it away <laughs> in 2005 to another friend of mine. You animal! Uh, well, you know, and You who got knows? it back. I got it back. You saw the error of your ways. You don't often get second chances. No, you don't get second chances in life. You know, and Lancia has had such a tortured sort of history. Vincenzo Lancia, of course, goes back to the early days of motoring. And then his son... Johnny. His, Johnny. Johnny took over the company. Interesting story. The son didn't like Mussolini. And he joined the Communist Party for two weeks. And after two weeks, he said, this is stupid, I'm out of here. Then World War II happened. Then the Marshall Plan came in. And the Americans, under the Marshall Plan, the idea was to rebuild Europe. And America went to Fiat and said, here's a bunch of money. Went to Alfa Romero, said, here's a bunch of money. Got to Lancey and said, here's a bunch of Whoa, whoa, Communist Party. But I only in for two weeks. Sorry. And so Lancia got no money at all. So consequently, their cars were much more expensive to produce and manufacture than Fiat and Alfa Romeo, plus they couldn't update their tooling and all the other things, and that's kind of why I think they went out of business. It had nothing to do with the quality of the product. Had you heard that story before? Well, um, I have heard the story before, but the, um, sort of what actually happened was that Johnny Lancia joined a resistance group mm -hmm. during the war, and this right. resistance group had members from all political parties, including the communists, oh, although okay. the communists were the largest members of this particular okay. group. But it wasn't just the Marshall Plan money that, that almost put Lancia out of business three times. It was the fact that from Vincenzo Lancia's time on through Johnny Lancia, the Lancia engineers <laughs> just wanted to build and design the best car they could. Right. They didn't care how much it cost to build a car. They just said, we want to make this the best. If this is a good way to do this, there's a better way to do it. Let them figure out how to, how to pay for it. When you look at just the way the hood opens on my Lancia, you know, most cars you put, you put the stick up, and you not go, right? and things slide into place, and it holds it. And it's beautifully designed. And the gearbox is magnificent. It's a transaxle. We had the gearbox apart before we put it together. Just all the bearings, I mean, it was just beautifully put together. So they were just too expensive for most people. They were, they were built better than people needed. These are truly it. engineers' cars, right. and um, it takes someone with a real um, appreciation of the mechanical, like you have, to really appreciate what goes into a launch up, because also, typically, they had smaller engines than some of their competitors. Right, right. If, if Alfa Romeo had a 1.3 liter engine, the Lancia was a 1.1, things like that. But right. it was also about the fact that Lancia, of course, is a great pioneer, as you mentioned, it's a company founded in 1906 uh, by Vincenzo Lancia. They had the first unit body in 1922 right. with the Lambda. The first production V6 engine with your Aurelia and in 1950. Vittorio Giano. Vittorio Giano, exactly. Right. Yeah. And uh, the rear transaxle, um, the first production five-speed transmission in a car right. with, the, with the Ardea. And the first radial tires as well. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, it was all about advanced engineering and, and great build. It's so Communists, they're the ones. <laughs> so there's a little Absolutely. truth to my version too, but obviously yours is the more accurate one. Let's get back to this car. Now, this is a Zagato body car. Yes. So this is rare. Did you import this from Italy? What did you, did they bring this into the United States? They did bring it to the U.S. I bought this car here in the U.S. This is one of the few U.S. original U.S. delivery cars. Okay. Lancia's had a very checkered 
sales history in the U.S. They sort of came in the uh, 1920s and was very successful in the U.S. and then went away until the 1950s when they had the Aurelia and then sort of faded away again until the mid-60s when they uh, brought this car in. Was this an expensive car in 67 compared to, I mean, you could have gotten, what, a Corvette or a Mustang for the price of this? Absolutely. The list price on this car was about $4,000 wow. in, in 1967. And um, the coupe and the sedan were a bit less expensive. But right. this, is, this is the top of the line of the Fulvius. And what are we talking, 1.3? 1.3 liter engine. Uh, when these were introduced, they manufactured the uh, the Sport, as this is called, from 1965 to 1972, and it went through first a 1.2 liter engine, mm -hmm. then a 1.3, as this has, then 1.6. So you could have gotten an XKE, or a Corvette, or even a Shelby Mustang, for the price of this car. And you know, when I was a kid, V8s always trumped everything. You know, when you're a teenager. A Corvette with 360 horsepower or 112, 115, well, give me the Corvette. I mean, it was just the mentality, the mindset of the day. You didn't think in terms of finesse and sophistication. It was just sort of... Raw power. But, yeah, raw power, <laughs> brute horsepower. Uh, uh, and this was sort of the last golden age for Lancia because what happened in the 70s and 80s, at least from my perspective, they seem to be built down to a price rather than up to a standard. Well, there's a the very simple standard. explanation for that, Jay. Yeah. They, once again, they went to the wall in 1955 uh, after Johnny Lanch's incredibly successful uh, racing campaign bankrupted the company. Right. I mean, but, but he brought victory at Le Mans and the Mille Miglia and right. the Carrera Panamericana. I mean, Lancia made Ferrari afraid in mm -hmm. terms of the sports racing car field. And they got it all back together under a new owner in 1955. He kept the company going until 1969, when it hit the wall again, and it was taken over by Fiat. Right. And they kept some of these models, like this one, in production, but they gradually replaced the original Lancia parts with some Fiat parts. What do they make call it? it decontent what do they call de it? Decontenting. Decontenting. Exactly. Yeah, taking the quality pieces out. Yeah, it, it, it sort of like it became like General Motors. Instead of being at the top, they fell into the hierarchy of Fiat, below Alfa Romeo, below. And, exactly. and it's the same. So this really represents the last great gasp for this, this company. It represents two, two last great gasps, actually. Um, the last great gasp of, of Lancia in terms of its pure engineering and design uh, philosophy, as well as for Zagato, this was sort of a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually the first car that Zagato built in appreciable numbers as a production car. They built, uh, between 1965 and 1972, they built uh, 7,000 uh, wow. sports, which is a, a fairly big number. Uh, the first 900 of them were all alloy. Then they switched to a steel and alloy, like this car is. This is steel and alloy. Steel and alloy. Doors are steel. The, the body panels are steel. The doors and the hood and the deck lid are aluminum. Okay. And, um, and they made about 1,000 of these, and then they went to an all steel body. So the chassis was shipped over. They weren't complete cars. The body was taken off, then Zagato put them on. It was, it was, it was Platforms. Uh, platforms. Uh, Lancia okay. would send them the platform for the car, and Zagato built these bodies and trimmed them, and then sent them back to Lancia. I'm trying to find Zagato touches. I always think of Zagato as having the bubble roof, but not, not all the vehicles obviously had that. No, and Zagato, of course, um, Zagato really made their name uh, in competition. Uh, this, the thing that set Zagato apart, they built very well-designed, very well-built, lightweight bodies. Mm -hmm. And the Zagato brothers, uh, all and Zagato's father, uh, all raced. So they understood what was needed in a racing car. They built great seats, as you will experience in a little while. And the double bubble roof that you see in some of the Zagatos from the 50s are purely practical. Right. They give headroom for the helmets and the drivers. Right, right. This car has sufficient headroom, so it doesn't need the double bubble. But some of the Zagato uh, tr uh, treatments that you'll see are the, the pointy rear end, a right. sort of a bluff front end. You'll see that in a lot of Zagato designs. Right. And also, the way they handle air. There's a really, really neat detail in this car, which is amazing, where you have this sort of positive and negative. It brings the air up here, and then it goes negative to force the air into the engine compartment. OK, so this is a working scoop. That's a working scoop. All right, very nice. So that's and the really tires almost sit proud of the fender, don't they? Uh, they do. They should come up to the fender. Um, I have to confess that these are modern square shoulder tires, which I shouldn't have on the car. They should be round. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thank Cut. you very much. We're out of here. <laughs> Cut. That's it. We're done. Thank you. No, no. I understand. That's, that's, what, that's what happened. Uh, but round, a rounded shoulder, uh, shoulder tire, as right. it, it carried when it was newer, would come to the edge of the, uh, the wheel arch, but not, not exceed it. You know, it's interesting because it's a car, the more I look at it, the more I like it. 
it doesn't initially strike me the first time I see it, but then as I study it, oh, and then you gradually like it more and more, you know what I mean? Which, which I think, to me, it adds a timelessness to it. Because cars like Countach's flash right away, but then they look 80s after a while. Mm -hmm. This could really be, this could almost be a modern design. And the four headlights actually are an interesting um, thing because these are the mark of the U.S. delivery cars. Okay. As I said, they made very few of those in Europe. They had a square headlight, and the very first ones had a plastic cover over oh, the headlights right, that actually yeah. matched. Much this like contour. Citroën, we had these. Exactly. We had these stupid laws in this country. You had to have this seal beam light from 1948 on everything. <laughs> and Can we open the hood? Let's sure take thing. a look. Even the hood opens in an unusual way. Go ahead. Oh, there we are. Oh, they brought back full the, access. They brought back the stick. <laughs> now, it's so funny. Initially, when I looked under the hood, I thought, "Oh, it's a V6 like mine." But it's obviously it's a, it's, it's a four, but it's, it's canted over this way a little bit. Narrow angle V4 engine. Yeah. Uh, Launch again uh, pioneered a lot of development on that with the Landa 1922, the V4 engines. Yeah. And uh, the interesting thing too, it is canted over to get a lower hood line and better better fit. But the actual the block is actually cast. At an angle. And the engine is ahead of the front axle. Yes, the engine is ahead of the front axle with the uh, transaxle uh, sitting directly on the axle line. Okay, very good, very good. Wow. And it's 1.3 and how many horsepower? 100 uh, 115 horsepower. 115, okay. And it's got these really nice big uh, Solex uh, 35 PHH. I mean, the carburetors, carburetors look bigger <laughs> than the engine. Like wearing a sombrero, it's bigger than the guy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. People say, is there an engine somewhere under those carburetors? Well, what is the weight distribution here? I wonder, it doesn't affect the hand, doesn't feel? You'll see the handling and is absolutely wonderful in this car. And no, you would think that surprisingly, with all this weight up front, that you would have a real front weight bias, which yeah. you don't find in this car. I just, I, I just obviously mistakenly assumed that, you know, that any front wheel cars from this period would have torque steer and whatnot. I remember the Italians used to say, you can never put more than 200 horsepower through the front wheels right. because it torques it. And then the Oldsmobile Toronado came out with 375 and blew that out of the water. Exactly. So I always thought compared to a railier, these would pull and whatnot, but no, huh? Not at all. I mean, to your point, if this had in 1967, 1965, when it was designed, if this had 280 or 300 horsepower, they probably would have had a challenge. Sure. But I think that, that with the amount of horsepower that this has and with the amount of torque that it has, I think it hands it quite well. And there's the functioning, uh, functioning vent there. Vent that you can and see. Actually, and actually, and goes into this air box here. So. Okay, so that's pulling air in rather than pulling hot air out of the Correct. engine. Correct, okay. exactly. exactly. Okay, so it goes in this air box to where? Into uh, the interior. Oh, oh, it's the interior. Okay, so it's Help not. Keeps us n keep so, us nice and cool. So it's not to the engine, <laughs> it's to the interior. Okay, very, very good. Because who needs air conditioning? Now tell us about the wheels. Those are obviously the stock wheels. Uh, these are not the stock wheels. Oh, these not. are a period option. These Campagnolo. Mm -hmm. no, no, these 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 are the hot ticket. Okay, these are the Campagnolo yeah. alloy wheels that were run on the competition and rally versions. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we didn't talk about it before, but of course we talked about Lancia's competition history. Right. And Zagato especially is known for building competition cars, lightweight competition cars, and they did campaign the Fulvia Sport. Not extensively, because at this point they were really looking to the Fulvia Coupe as their rally car in front. Right. But these cars ran and did very well in class at Sebring and um, at Daytona uh, in the uh, GT classes. And they use four lugs, not five. Four lugs, and you'll also notice that this is a little bit of license I took. I didn't bother to paint them, but you notice that they're brass lugs. Right. All of the of the fittings on launches are brass. It's a two plus two. That's what, like like a 911 or like anything yeah, else. Correct. Like that. Exactly. Yeah, correct. Exactly. God, those look lunch. like the most comfortable seats in the world. I can't wait to sit in them. They are. That's one of the other things that Zagato is known for. Zagato engineered and built wonderful sport seats. They're they're amazingly uh, sportive. You'll see. And the back end is very pretty too. Let's come around here and see the back. This is you know Zagato just has their own way of doing things. I love this line through here almost looks like the disco volante car exactly the way it comes around here uh, it's it's just so unusual and of course the script that they choose <laughs> is different in this uh fulvia sport. fulvia sport and with this little doohickey on the end i don't know what that is uh, 1.3 oh oh that's uh, actually, a one point because, because oh, in, yes, in of italy of course they use a comma instead of the uh, decimal point that is a 1.3 okay very nice a little and, and the way this rear hatch opens. Yeah, it's show me that. So neat. Okay. Oh, it's electric. Good day, Mr. Bond. <laughs> now it's it, electric. Is that for the ventilation? 
Bravo, well done. That's for the ventilation Important. because the, uh, the vent windows nor the quarter windows open. So when you're driving the car, you get flow through ventilation this way. Okay. And to load the luggage, you just pull the strap oh, and then you've got access to the luggage compartment. Switch. Well, this would have been a pretty good family car, wouldn't it, back in the day if you oh, were yeah. a young guy with a family or something? And I mean, very practical. This would be almost the equivalent of like an Italian Mustang sort of. Precisely. It? And I, I've got a very good friend in the UK who was. He and his brother were driven to school uh, every day in, in their dad's uh, Fulvia Sport, but yeah. the, uh, the rear hatch uh, never actually worked, so they had to leave it open all the time. And they said it was pretty tough. They kept stealing radios from it and stuff like oh, that. But. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am anxious to try out these sports seats you've been talking about. Uh, let's take this thing for a ride. You're going to love it. Wow, I love how much leg room there is. Oh, that's amazing. And I love the classic Italian driving position. Mm -hmm. Now boy, these seats really are comfortable. And the entire point is that not that you have to conform to the seat. The seat should conform to you. Right, and that's right. what these do. Yeah. You know, they hold you in place really nicely, but they're not boy. forcing you anywhere. I mean, this really feels like a chair I would have in my living room. Yeah, and you could sit in this car and drive for hours and hours, you know. Hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> hey, your date's better looking than mine. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> What does that name mean, Fulvia? What does it mean? Fulvia is an old Roman name. Oh, okay. And uh, there was a time when they named all of the uh, Lancia cars after the great Roman roads. The Via Flaminia, the okay. Via Appia, oh, the okay. Via Fulvia. Sure, sure. These okay. are all the great Roman roads. Right. Italian cars, especially coach-built cars like Zagato and, and things like that, have a reputation for being sort of flimsy and tinny. This car feels like it's one piece. It's actually right. amazing yeah. how solid it's got. No rattles. It's, it's yeah. astonishing. This car has never been apart. Oh, really? Yeah. And how many miles? 87,000? 87,000 wow, miles. Wow, that's a lot of miles. Yeah. Well, it certainly feels a lot bigger than a 1.3. It's a yeah. torquey little motor. Yes, it is. Well, you know, when you drive these kind of cars on the roads, they're meant to be driven on fast two-lane roads. This road is a good example of it. You know, it just it gives you a whole different appreciation for the car. Oh, yeah. 6,000 RPM red line. I became an Italian car nut because of Alfa Romeo. I used to drive new Alphas and old Mercedes. Right. And then they stopped uh, bringing new Alphas in, so I started driving new Mercedes and old Alphas. Right. And uh, I always thought that Alfa Romeo was the king of cars, and, and, and it is in many, many ways. But then I discovered Lancia, and just the level of, of sophistication and smoothness in a Lancia compared to an Alfa yeah. was just astonishing to me. So some people think that I sort of started at the top and working my way down, but I don't look at it that way. My first launcher was a 1950 B50 Vignale Coupe, Aurelia. Uh, one of five made, one of two left. It was an amazing car, but I also lived in New York City. And it was the only classic car I had, and I liked to drive my cars. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one day I, I was stuck because of a brake issue on the side of a, the Cross County Expressway in the Bronx in New York with these 18-wheelers flying by me. And I thought, you know what? If something happens, every piece of trim on this car has got to be remade by hand. Right. It's not the right kind of car for someone who has one old car. Right, right. And so I sold it, and I regret it terribly. And then I got back at the launches. I've had a Flaminia, um, a couple of And where is it now? Do you know where it is? You know where um, <laughs> Interestingly enough, I sold it at auction at Pebble yeah. Beach in uh, 2000 and got absolutely no money for it. It's a disaster of a story. And it was offered for sale again last year in Italy. I sold it at the auction for $11,500. It was offered last year in Italy for sale for 180,000 euro. Wow. I didn't buy it back. <laughs> wow. But, uh, and the guy had done nothing to it. It still had my Connecticut license plates in it. Wow. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, the car's around. I'd imagine this probably gets pretty good mileage, doesn't it? It does. Uh, on the on the drive uh, drive up here from home, I think I was averaging somewhere around uh, 24 miles to the gallon. My wife is about to eat. If there's not a spot in front of the restaurant, we're not eating there. <laughs> if I can't see the car from the window, we're not eating right. there. Thank you. <laughs> I don't care how many stars the place has. Grab a sandwich to go, <laughs> and we'll eat it in the car. <laughs> well, I can't believe how comfortable these seats are. They're amazing, I promised. I mean, if you look at, at every, I mean, go, even going back to the 1930s, you look at some of the um, 1920s, actually, 
you look at some of the uh, the famous the Zagato 60, 17, 50 cars. Yeah, yeah. Those seats are amazing. Zagato always knew because they were they were racers. They knew what they liked to sit in and would right. And Zagato cars were frankly more successful in many races in the 1950s because the drivers weren't as tired. Right, right. Now this seems like a Lancia kind of road. This is absolutely a Lancia kind of road. I feel like I, I'm somewhere in the hills above Turin. Well, it's, it's kind of like that, actually. Well, again, Lancia being very engineer-driven, at this yeah. point, the chief engineer in the company was Antonio Fessia. And Antonio Fessia had this dream about this front-wheel drive car that he had designed in 1940. Okay. And now, was he, he inspired by Cord or any of those guys? He was very much influenced by Cord and by Miller and all yeah. the engineering work that that, uh, that was going on in America then. And so he had the dream of this car, and he tried to find a backer for it. It's called the Chemsa. And he built a prototype, and they never got the backing. They never could build it. And so he sort of hung on to these, these files. He, he carried them with him wherever he went. And then when Lancia was sold in 1955, this fellow yeah. Pazenti, he needed a new chief engineer. So Fessia said, not only am I your guy, but I've got the plans for your new car. Oh, OK. <laughs> and so the Flavia was basically the, the development of the plans he had for this 1940 car. Right. And then the Fulvia was the, uh, the next generation of it for the smaller version. You could buy a Fulvia, a Flavia, a Flaminia, and in those three different lines, you had six different models of Flaminia. You yeah, had the see, factory that sounds car, like Pinafrina. something you catch from being with the wrong woman. I got, I got Flaminia. <laughs> and you got know, six versions of it, too. She, she gave me Flaminia. Oh, my God! Oh, God, you got Flaminia. That's terrible. <laughs> we go right up there to that peak. Oh, yeah. What do you think of the way this car handles? You know, it's nice. It, 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 I mean, the torque pulls you through all the corners. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've yet to drop it into fourth gear. You just stay in third gear or second. And this is where the uh, the diameter of the wheel really comes in handy, because you just do this, yeah, and the other exactly. car goes where you want to go. I got a great uh, car story about my dad, too. Because we lived in New York City, we didn't have to have a car. My family didn't buy their first car until I was 12 years old. Yeah. And so my dad's factory moved from uh, Long Island City in Queens to North Bergen, New Jersey. And so he tried commuting for a little bit and then decided, nah, uh, we're not going to move. We're not going to commute. I have to get a car. So my two brothers and I, of course, we're car experts. 1967. So we tell him, you've got to buy a Peugeot 404. Right. So you think this is really cool, you know, neat, Pininfarina design, all this. Right. He goes to look at it, the Peugeot dealer, comes out and says, coin's a word. There is no way I'm going to spend $4,000 on a car with no stylage. <laughs> so he buys a, a 67 Pontiac Catalina four-door hardtop instead. Now, that was a car with stylage. That's funny. <laughs> this is the perfect road for this car. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, you see what I mean when you get up here? This is astonishing. If it wasn't a stupid camera car in front of us, we could make some time. <laughs> So seldom get to be a passenger. Uh, I love this guy so much. Let's explain the dash here. This is what I like about Lancia, just the quality feel like your turn indicator here. It just it's metal, it has a nice click. You ever drive a Chrysler K car? It's like breaking a chicken bone. <laughs> Every time you take crack, crack, ah, it's the most annoying noise in the world. Uh, cars, pretty standard dashboard, uh, a speedometer, fuel cost, water temperature, oil pressure, a tachometer. I love these. You call them piano switches. Piano key switches, yeah. Piano key switches, exactly, okay. Exactly, black and white there. Now, what do these do? Um, one operates the uh, windshield wipers, okay. another is the heater blower, and the third is an accessory switch, which here is wired up to the driving light in front. I see. And what do we have here? Uh, that is the headlights. And? And this is the uh, dashboard lights. Okay, and uh, on the car's clock, clock, and of course the uh, AM FM radio this switch here operates uh, the rear hatch. What this does on this car is flash the headlights, and the horn button is on the outside. So you can flash the lights and blow the horn at the same time if you want. But Come on, let's go drive some more.
things with any sign. I pitch them stories all the time. And A, the story has to have a hook. This car also loves modern highways. I oh, mean, yeah. Uh, this thing's got about 80 turning 4,000 RPM, yet not buzzy at all. It's very smooth. It loves the highway. Yeah. Well, what a terrific car. You know, it's fun to spend half your life reading the road test and then finally get to drive the car. And it's exactly what uh, what I thought it would be. You know, it's, uh, well, I'm not sure what I thought it would be because I, I like the rear wheel drive and I I don't really notice much difference. A beautiful handling car. As I said, it's a bit of an anomaly when you're in 4,000 RPM in second gear. I go, boy, this thing's a little buzzy. Then 4,000 in, in fourth gear, 80, 90 miles an hour, dead smooth. I Absolutely. mean, it's uh, it's just a fascinating car. This is the golden age of Lancia. This is when they, this is their peak, wasn't it? When it was finally coming to an end and they built the best cars they could build. So, uh, Donald, thank you very much. My I appreciate pleasure, it. I appreciate your good taste. And uh, thanks for bringing this car here. It's fun to, 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 uh, to read about something and get to drive it for the very first time on camera. So, very cool. See you guys next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>